Hi everyone, welcome to our first week of lessons in Biology 2, Unit 4, Chapter 1. Last semester we ended a Biology 1 by talking about um, genetics and inheritance, so the inheritance from parent to child. Now we're going to talk about the genetics of an entire population, the whole population, and how changes affect that population. As always, if you click on this link, you will get the guided notes, a copy of the guided notes. You can print those out and fill them out by hand or on the computer, and there might be an extra credit opportunity unlocked later on in the semester that has to do with taking notes. So make sure that you're taking those notes and keeping them somewhere you know uh, where to find them. All right, so populations are not static. Populations often change over time due to different factors such as mutation, natural selection, gene flow, and genetic drift. And we'll talk about examples of each one of those later on. But let's talk about what happens when none of those things are occurring, when there's no mutation, no gene flow, no genetic drift, and no natural selection. So uh, there's this guy, Hardy Weinberg, and he said that if none of those things are happening, then we should expect the offspring population to be exactly the same as the parent population. Now I keep using that word population. Population is a group of individuals of the same species that live and interbreed in the same area. So for instance, we have our wild hogs right here. Now we could have another group of wild hogs over here. And these wild hogs are technically the same species Okay, they could, if I took a helicopter and picked this guy up, okay, we picked this smiley guy up and we dropped him over here. Um, they could interbreed because they're the same species, but since they're so far apart, that doesn't naturally occur. So we would consider this to be its own population, let's say wild hogs in Southeast Texas. And this would be considered its own population of hogs, let's say, in Florida. They're different populations, even though they're the same species. Now, there's this other word called gene pool. It's okay if you think of gene pool and population as similar concepts, but they are not the same. Because a gene pool is only the copies of the genes or alleles, okay, that get passed on to the next population. So let's look at this population of hogs. Let's say this individual is a juvenile and too young to interbreed. Is it part of the gene pool? No, it is not contributing its genes to the next uh, generation. Let's talk about this guy. Maybe he's too old or too sick to breed. Not part of the gene pool, even though they are part of the population. The gene pool are all of the active alleles that could get passed on to the next generation. All right, let's keep talking about our little hog friends. Hardy Weinberg principle states that the frequencies of these alleles will stay the same given that none of those other things are happening. None of these things are happening then the uh, frequency of each allele should stay the same from generation to generation. For instance, if I have 10% um, dominant, homozygous dominant hogs in the parent generation, if I come back in 10 years and recount the hogs, I would expect to still find 10% homozygous dominant hogs in that same population. Does that happen in real life? Not often, and we'll talk about what happens when we do not uh, adhere to the Hardy-Weinberg principle. But what we're going to talk about uh, right now is the theoretical offspring based on the Hardy-Weinberg principle. So if you need a review about these letters, the alleles and how we talk about dominant is capital B, um, or the capital letter and recessive is the lowercase letter, then you can click this link to review unit three uh, where we go over all of this. But first, let's talk about Hardy-Weinberg equation. In the Hardy-Weinberg equation, we consider P to be dominant. So if I'm trying to find all of the dominant alleles, I'm going to consider this to be a dominant allele, 
this to be a dominant allele and this to be a dominant allele. So all of the homozygous dominant and half of the heterozygotes. And then we call the recessive allele Q. So this would be a Q, this would be a Q, and this would be a Q. So if I'm trying to find all of the alleles in the whole gene pool, let's say this is the gene pool right here, I can count up all the big Bs, and that will equal to P. And if I count up all the little Bs, okay, that will be Q. If I've counted all the little Bs and all the big Bs, that is 100% of the gene pool right here. So that equals 1 or 100%. Thus, P or all of the dominant alleles plus Q, all of the recessive alleles, equal 100% of the population. Now, the Hardy-Weinberg equation will state, will give you a clue on what the individuals might be like. So how many dom homozygous dominant, how many homozygous recessive, and how many heterozygotes there might be based on the P and the Q value. So if I'm counting up all of the dominant alleles, then I'm going to count uh, P times P. When I do P times P, I end up with P squared. And then I'm going to count all of the heterozygote individuals, which is P times Q. If I do P times Q, I end up with this, PQ. Now we'll get to why there's a 2 here in just a second. It's important and it belongs there. But right now let's just focus. Heterozygote means PQ or PQ means heterozygote. And then if I'm trying to find the percentage of the offspring that might be homozygous recessive, it's going to be Q times Q or Q squared. If I add up all the individuals that are P squared plus all of the individuals that are Q squared plus all of the individuals that are PQ, I should get 100% of the population. So the Harry Weinberg equation is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. Don't let that intimidate you. All we're doing is adding up all of the dominant individuals, all of the recessive individuals, and all of the heterozygote individuals. Let's work with a different population, switching gears from pigs to these little insects, these little bugs. So the first thing that I need to do is find my P and Q. This capital A represents dominant, so that's going to be our P value. And this lowercase a represents recessive, and that's going to be our Q value. How do I get that number? Well, I'm going to count up all of the alleles in the whole gene pool. If I count up the capital letters, I get one, two, three, four, five, six. Six out of 20. If I divide six by 20, I get 0.3, or 30%. Now we have to do the same thing with A, or lowercase a, the Q value. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 out of 20 individuals is equal to 0.7. So my P value is 0.3 and my Q value is 0.7. Now I can predict what the offspring might be. I'm going to take a heterozygote cross, dominant A, recessive A. I'm going to multiply a cross just like I normally would with a Punnett square. So this is kind of like a Punnett square where I have the parent individual on either side. Now I'm going to pull down the numbers, 0.3 times 0.3, the P times P, that means we're doing P squared. P squared is 0.3 times 0.3 for this example, which equals to 0.09. This means that if nothing changes, if there's no mutations, no genetic drift, no uh, natural selection, then I should expect 0.09 homozygous dominant or 9% homozygous dominant in the offspring of this cross. 
Let's do this one. 0. 0.7 times 0. 0.3. That means P times Q because this is our P value, this is our Q value. If I'm multiplying P times Q, I'm going to get 0. 0.3 times 0. 0.7, which equals 0. 0.21. This is the number of heterozygotes, but Pay attention, there's another heterozygote right here in this section of the Punnett square in which the answer is also 0.21, which is why instead of just doing PQ, we do 2PQ because there's two instances of the heterozygote on this Punnett square. So I'm not going to put 0.21, I'm actually going to put 0.42 or 42% because of this cross, I would expect 42% of the offspring to be heterozygotes. The last square is going to be 0.7 or Q times 0.7 or Q. If I do Q times Q, that's the same as saying Q squared. That's a two guys, two, a Q squared, which equals 0.49 or 0.49%. So I can predict that the offspring of this population, the next generation of this population, would have 9% homozygous dominant, 42% heterozygote, and 49% homozygous recessive, which is what this states. So the frequency of uh, dominant A is P, the frequency of recessive A is Q, here is our formula, and we got the same answer. Whether we use the Punnett square or the math problem, we end up with this answer. And this is the purpose of the Hardy-Weinberg. We're trying to find out the theoretical expected value. Let's do a sample problem. So I'm still trying to find the P and the Q value. I'm not using the Hardy-Weinberg equation yet. I just want to know what is P and what is Q. If I know that the parent population has 360 homozygous dominant, 480 heterozygotes, and 160 homozygous recessive, I can find out the P and the Q value fairly easily. All of these individuals are dominant, so I'm going to add them to half of the alleles in this group. Half of the alleles in this group are dominant and half of them are recessive. So I'm going to divide this number by half. I have 240 that are dominant and 240 that are recessive. So if I'm trying to find my P value, I'm gonna count up all the dominants. So 360 plus 240 equals 600. If I divide that by the entire population, which is 1,000 individuals, then I'm going to get 0.6 or 60% for my P value. My Q value, I'm gonna do the exact opposite. I'm going to add the recessive number plus half of the heterozygotes number, so 240 plus 160. This should equal to 400, which is 0.4, or 40%. Uh, 0.6 plus 0.4 equals one or 100%. So that's our way of checking our answer. Um, let's now apply the Hardy-Weinberg equation to this example. Here I have a Q value of 0.4 and a P value of 0.6, which is what we found out on the last slide. All we have to do is substitute P and Q in the formula with these numbers. And I'm going to substitute it in every single spot. So P squared is the same as saying 0.6 squared. 2PQ is the same as saying 2 times 0.6 times 0.4. And Q squared is the same as saying 0.4 squared. All we have to do is multiply that out. 0.6 times 0.6 is 0.36. So in the Next generation, I would expect 36% of the offspring to be homozygous dominant. 2 times 0.6 times 0.4 is 0.48.
That means I expect the next generation to be 48% heterozygotes and the last one 0.4 times 0.4. All right, if we multiply these two together, we are going to get 0.16. Sorry, uh, Paradeck likes to exit if I get too close to this black uh, bar right here. 0.16 or 16% homozygous recessive. If I want to check my answer, I just have to add these together and it should equal 1 or 100% of the population. Now, this is still just our expected value, our theoretical ideal value. So um, this result should say yes, we have not deviated from the norm. But it does deviate from the norm in real life because for the Hardy-Weinberg principle to be true, we are working off of five assumptions that there is no mutations. OK, so we can't have mutations. We have to have random mating. There's no selection of any kind. It has to have a large population and there cannot be any gene flow. So we need a large population and random mating, but we can't have mutations, selection or gene flow of any kind. If any of those things happen, then we will deviate from these expected values, which means we can measure the deviation. How far away from normal are we? Um, so here in this example, we are going to do a dihybrid cross to find our expected ratios of these peaks. Um, remember, there's always 16 boxes in a dihybrid square and one of those will be double recessive if we did a heterozygote, heterozygote cross. So we're expecting one out of 16 to be homozygous recessive. We're expecting nine out of 16 to be smooth and yellow. We're expecting three out of 16 to be smooth and green. And we're expecting three out of 16 to be wrinkled and yellow. So if I count, if I actually did this cross and I counted up all of my peas, I had to count hundreds and hundreds of peas, and I found that 701 were smooth and yellow. And this is out of 1,216. If I divide 701 by 1,216, I get 57%. This is my observed frequency. This is what actually happened in real life. I can compare that to my expected theoretical frequency. This is my Hardy-Weinberg frequency. And if I divide nine by 16, I get 56%. This is only a 1% difference. So it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but I don't know for certain unless I do a best fit or a chi-squared test. So let's learn how to compare our observed frequency with our expected frequency. The chi-squared test states that chi-squared is the sum of the observed minus the expected frequency, okay? And we're gonna square that, divided by the expected frequency. OK, whenever we see this uh, symbol, it means the sum of it means we're going to be adding together this equation more than once. OK, in this case, we have three groups. We have the dominant group. We have the recessive group. And we have the heterozygote group. OK. So we're going to be adding this equation together three different times. So when I write it out, it's going to look like this. This will be the group for homozygous dominant. This will be heterozygous. And this will be the homozygous recessive. Now let's plug in our observed and our expected values. My observed value, make sure that we don't get these confused, my observed value for the dominant category is 348. 
So I write 348 and I'm going to subtract my expected value. Here we have the expected, which is 360. Then of course, squared and divide by the expected. Now it doesn't matter if we accidentally switch these numbers. Since we're squaring it, it's going to make it um, positive anyways, even if we end up with a negative number here. But it is really, really, really important that you make sure that the expected value is on the bottom. We want to make sure that we put the expected, uh, expected value on the bottom of the denominator. All right, let's uh, use PEMDAS and multiply this out. Remember everything inside of the parentheses first, then we're going to square, then we're going to divide. The last thing we will do is add everything together. So in the next step, if I simplify this equation, I will get negative 12 squared divided by 360 plus negative 8 squared divided by 480 plus 200, I'm sorry, 20 squared divided by 160. Where did I get these numbers? That is the observed frequency minus the expected frequency. Let's simplify it even more. And we get 140 over 360 plus 64 over 480 plus 400 divided by 160. And now we can simplify that further. We get 0.4 plus 0.133 plus 2.5. When we add all of that together, we should get three point, sorry, I got too close to that pair deck. Zero, three, three should be our chi-squared value. Now the chi-value doesn't mean anything by itself unless we're comparing it to a chi-squared chart. So every set of data is going to have a chi-squared chart. If you run into a problem asking about chi-squared, then you should get a chart if it's necessary for answering that question. So what is the chi-squared chart value? Well, the chart is going to be kind of a spread. Um, this is a representation of the chi value and it should follow kind of a normal curve, okay? Most um, populations will follow this normal curve, meaning that we have some outliers down here at the bottom and we have some outliers down here at the top, but most of the population falls within this normal range. So this is normal. That means that if our chi value, our chi squared value falls within the normal range, it's not statistically significant. That means that maybe that 1% that our P's are different, if that falls within the normal range, if 1% is within the normal range, then it's not statistically significant difference. But let's say that uh, we have a much bigger change, our chi value is is three. This may or may not be a statistical difference depending on where it falls on the probability. So we're mainly focused on these extreme tails. There's one tail up here and there's one tail down here. And these represent about 5% of the population. So we'll have about 5% of the population that are considered outliers um, depending on what trait we're talking about. This is just the extreme end of the normal curve. So if my chi value lands here, it doesn't make a difference. There's no change, no assumable change. But if our chi value lands up here within this 5% range, then it means that it is a critical value. It is statistically significant. That's why we have to find this line. And this is where the chart helps us. This line is called the critical value. It's the difference between not statistically significant and highly statistically significant. So we're going to use the chart to find that. In order to use the chart, we're going to need to find the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is just how many, um, how many categories we have minus one. So for instance, with these three individuals, we have one, two, three categories, which means we have two degrees of freedom. Okay. So we're working with two degrees of freedom. The P value is the probability or the, uh, 
how strict we want our test to be. For our purposes, this will always be 5% or 0 0.05. It's just asking us how big do we want this tail to be? And we always want it to be 5% of the population. In some more advanced statistics, we might be even more specific and we might only care about 2% of the population or 2.5% of the population, but for our purposes, P will always be 0 0.05 or 5%. Now, what does that mean when you get a crazy chart that looks like this? Well, it means that we're going to be caring about the degrees of freedom. We have two degrees of freedom, so we're going to look here. And our P value, or I'm sorry, our probability, which is 0 0.05, which is right here. So I'm going to be looking to where these two groups enter um, or cross, which is 5.99. That means our critical value is 5.99. If our chi-squared value is less than that, we are not statistically significant. So in this case, the change is not statistically um, significant with this strict of a test. That means this number right here is almost 6. It's 5.99. And our critical value is maybe somewhere around here at about three. So we did not fall within this red range. Another way that we can do this test is using a chi-squared calculator. The chi-squared calculator is really easy. Uh, we're going to be doing the same thing, though. We're going to plug in the expected value and the observed value of each category. So for this, the expected value is 360, and the observed value is 348. Let next category, uh, the expected is 480, and the observed is 472. Last category, the observed is 180, and the expected is 160. Once we've plugged all that information in, we can calculate and look, they have the same exact answer as us, 3.033 with two degrees of freedom. And they say it is not statistically significant, which is the same answer that we got. So the Hardy-Weinberg principle, like we mentioned, only applies to perfect populations or populations that aren't experiencing a lot of changes. This can be true within a population for one set of genes, but not the other. Uh, for instance, if I surveyed everyone in the class and 75% uh, of the students had brown hair and 25% of the students had blonde hair, and I came back five years from now and I re-surveyed my class, I wouldn't really expect it to be exactly the same, but lo and behold, it was 75% brown hair, 25% uh, blonde hair. But then I started looking at eye color and the eye colors did change. So the Hardy-Weinberg principle can be true for some genes depending on their selection pressures and not others within the same population. That's why it's important to only look at one trait. When, when we did our probability statistic earlier, we were only focused on the trait of color where dominant was green and recessive was brown. So we're only focusing on one trait at a time. Now, if nothing is changing, then we would expect something, uh, some equilibrium, genetic equilibrium, where the alleles in a gene pool doesn't change from generation to generation. Of course, this doesn't always happen, but we can end up with something called fixation, where these changes are occurring very slowly, but eventually we will come to a somewhat homogenized population um, due to fixation. Um, just because the uh, population is isolated, though, does not mean that fixation will occur. It's just a, um, an occurrence that may or may not happen. And we can actually model this by looking at these flies. If I uh, start this uh, population, and each one of these populations are uh, independent and isolated, 
they're starting out mixed where we see some red flies and some brown flies. But if we speed this up, eventually over time, um, we see more and more separation of these populations. And notice we have an entire population of red flies, but right next door, an entire population of brown flies. That's because they've reached fixation where every single generation is going to have the exact same traits after that. Um, but that doesn't always happen. Normally there's deviations from those five Hardy-Weinberg principles. And these deviations are usually due to natural selection, gene flow, or genetic drift. Now we'll talk about natural selection in depth next week. That's what our whole lesson next week is about. Um, lots of different things go into what is natural selection. So we'll talk about that in detail next week. But this week, we're gonna talk a little bit about gene flow and genetic drift and some different kinds of changes that can happen over time to a population. So one type of change is genetic drift. This is chance events that can cause wild fluctuations in gene frequencies. For instance, founder effect, where we have a small group of a population, maybe these you know, few little butterflies, move to a new area. Now, they no longer have these uh, other genes available to them. And so this new population will start to look very different than the old population because they only have these genes available to them, a very small gene pool. Um, interbreeding can also affect this. Now, if we look at this interactive, we can run this experiment. It's kind of fun. I have these islands. And I can isolate the animals that reach this island in different ways. I can move the islands far away from the mainland and that causes it to become isolated. I can also like change the island size, which, which can cause it to become isolated. And we'll start to see that even with a little bit of migration, the populations within each island will vary wide, wildly. And it is definitely going to be different than the mainland. Um, so here we're seeing lots of blue, a uh, lot more blue than we would see in the total mainland population. Um, here I'm seeing red and yellow being really popular. So you can play with this. Um, it's just trying to give you an example of how populations can change after they become isolated. Another effect is bottlenecking, and bottlenecking is when some sort of natural disaster wipes out a huge portion of the population. So it's very similar in founder's ex uh, effect because we end up with a small isolated population that doesn't match the original gene pool, but this one is due to migration, and this one is due to some sort of natural disaster. So one example might be a large disease that kills many of the population or a natural disaster that kills many of the population. And you end up with a very small gene frequency. We don't, um, or small gene variety. We don't end up with all of the variety of the ma major population because most of those individuals have died. Um, so here is an example of founder's effect. In Tanzania, there's an island in Lake Victoria that is a what is known as an albino community because a long time ago some people moved there and they had a high rate of albinoism in their gene pool and as they continued to grow their community and have more and more generations that trait that is normally very rare in the main population becomes very very frequent within that smaller population and this happens in small isolated communities where a trait that maybe wouldn't make it in a larger population wouldn't be selected for is um, very, very common. Um, bottlenecking can be due to really anything that kills a large swath of the population, such as a natural disaster, like an earthquake or a volcano, a hurricane. Um, radiation, disease, really anything that just kills a large portion of the population. Now, there is something called heterozygosity, where the heterozygote actually has some sort of advantage over each of the uh, homozygote individuals. So, for instance, if this is the allele frequency, this would be mostly dominant and this would be mostly recessive and around the middle you would have about half dominant 
half recessive, right around 50 percent. So this group of individuals, I would call them mostly heterozygote. This group of individuals, I would call them mostly recessive. And this group of individuals, I would call them mostly dominant. Now, this makes a difference for some traits, and it doesn't make a difference for other traits. But in this case, this is an allele related to cold adaptations. So these individuals over here, they have no cold adaptations. They live in Georgia. If I took a fish from Georgia and transplanted it into Maine, it would probably die because it has no cold adapted alleles. It doesn't have this allele right here. If I took a homozygous dominant individual that is very cold adapted, but I took it and I put it in Georgia, it probably would have a hard time because it's more adapted to the cold weather and really not very um, comfortable in this warmer Georgia, Georgia heat. But the heterozygote individuals, I could take a heterozygote individual and place it in Maine and it would probably be okay. And I could take a heterozygote individual and place it in Georgia and it would probably be okay because it has one allele that is cold adapted and one allele that is not cold adapted. So there's a, an advantage to being a carrier of that gene. Um, let's talk about species. So species, it's a little bit different than a population. Like our example with the hogs, we can have a population of hogs in Texas and a population of hogs in Florida, and they're still members of the same species, but they are in different populations. But having them separated like that can lead to something called speciesation, where a group of individuals that used to be part of the same population have diverged so much that they became separate species. So for example, lions and tigers, long, long, long time ago, many, many, many generations ago, there was a common ancestor between a tiger and a lion, but they live in very different environments, different parts of the world. And so the big cats that lived more in the jungle area developed stripes and became uh, tigers or their descendants became tigers. And then the big cats that lived in the open plains developed this tan coloration and their descendants became lions. They are different species, but they do share some common traits. They look similar, they are both apex predators, and they actually have the same number of um, chromosomes. So humans have kind of forced them to interbreed, which is not normal. So let's talk about hybrids when we force animals to interbreed. One example, of course, is the liger. Now, ligers aren't known to be super healthy. They have um, mental decline, heart disease, they live short lives, um, and they also cannot breed and make more ligers. So not a great idea to breed a liger. That is something known as a post-zygotic isolation. Let's talk about the difference between pre-zygotic and post-zygotic. As a review, we remember that a zygote is when a sperm matches with an egg, it equals a zygote. I'm going to write Z for zygote because I'm having a hard time here. Now, a sperm has half the number of chromosomes and an egg has half the number of chromosomes. The zygote will have the full number of chromosomes right here. So this is a zygote. So if we're talking about pre-zygotic, we're talking about barriers that prevent this. If we're talking about post-zygotic, we're talking about barriers that prevent this. Let's talk about it. So some pre-zygotic barriers are things such as geographic isolation. Uh, post-zygotic uh, barriers are things like the hybrids not surviving to adulthood or being sterile, such as a mule, um, or being very sickly, like the liger, hybrid breakdown. So the liger has heart disease. It's probably not very great at passing on its genes just because it's sickly. So those are all post-zygotic mechanisms. Uh, the pre-zygotic barriers are going to separate them and prevent them from breeding. 
Um, so geographic isolation, um, ecologic isolation, behavioral isolation, maybe even temporal isolation, meaning that they're not even awake at the same time. They may live in the same area, but they wake up in the morning and then another group of the same species wakes up in the evening. If you're part of these two separate groups, you are not going to interbreed with the other one, which causes a prezygotic barrier, which can then lead to speciesation. Another example might be um, mechanical isolation. For instance, a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. A Chihuahua is a little two pound dog and a Great Dane is a 200 pound dog. They can't mechanically mate uh, by themselves. So this would not happen in the wild. So we talked about some ecological isolation. This is an example of ecological isolation. We have these three warblers. Let's imagine that they're all part of the same species, but these little warblers decide that the bottom of the tree is really nice and they're gonna spend a lot of their time at the bottom of the tree. These little warblers uh, wanna be king of the hill and they wanna spend all of their time at the top of the tree. Well, generation after generation after generation of this separation, these yellow rumped warblers no longer interbreed with the birds at the top. So they have become a completely separate species, AKA yellow rumped warblers. The ones at the top will never ever ever interact with the ones at the bottom. So now they are their own species called Cape May warblers. So they have divided their resources to avoid too much competition. And so now they are no longer competing for the whole tree. They're only competing for their small portion of the tree. Another really great example of speciesation would be these barnacles. We can look at these um, barnacles here, run this experiment. Now I have two types of barnacles. I have white barnacles and red barnacles. Now white barnacles are really, um, they don't dry out very easily, so they can spend a little bit more time above high tide. Um, the red barnacles, they do not like to get dried out. They need to stay moist in, uh, even in low tide. So they're gonna live lower, but they grow bigger, so they have an easier time preventing predation by these snails. Let's speed this up and see what happens. You notice that we're all starting kind of clumped out in the middle, but it doesn't take very long, just a few generations. And you start to see that the drier area is also protected from predators. So the white barnacles who like that drier area or they can survive that drier area start to be pushed further and further up. Whereas the red barnacles, they don't like the drier area. They're gonna be living lower, but they grow bigger. So they're a little bit protected from the predators. So we end up with this very distinct line right down the middle. And you can see easily how after only a few generations, we have two completely separate groups that will not interbreed with each other. Um, we also have something called hybrid zones. I mentioned ligers and mules because those are hybrids that humans have bred, but hybrids actually do occur in nature. Um, and several things can happen when a hybrid occurs. If you're looking in these hybrid zones, maybe you have one species that lives in this area and another species that lives in this area. You're gonna expect a hybrid zone kind of right in the middle of them. If I'm going to that hybrid zone and I count the number of individuals that are hybrid versus the originals, which are the original species, um, and I have many, many more of the original than I have of the hybrid, I'm gonna assume reinforcement happened, meaning that the hybrid wasn't as well adapted to the environment as the original species. Now, if I count and I end up with way more hybrids, like lots and lots of hybrids, and I can't find as many of the original species, then something has happened called fusion, meaning that that hybrid had some sort of advantage. And uh, so the hybrids bred and or the original species bred to make hybrids. So we see the hybrid much more frequently. We assume fusion. Those two species are now going to become one species again. Then we also have something called stability. If I go to this area and I count the number of hybrids 
and then I come back in 10 years and I count the number of hybrids and it's relatively the same, then I have stability, meaning the hybrid wasn't necessarily advantageous or disadvantageous. So um, it's going to be stable. All right, speciesation can be allopatric or sympatric, sim meaning the same. Allopatric speciesation is uh, very obvious. We have completely isolated and separated the two groups uh, physically, so geographical isolation, allopatric speciesation. Whereas sympatric speciesation means that a species can develop kind of within a group, and this may be more due to behavioral isolation or genetic isolation. So we have some differences between allopatric and sympatric. Sympatric is happening in the same exact spot. Allopatric is after physical separation. There are two different theories behind these changes. Like how do these changes occur over time? When I was young and learning about um, evolution, though I don't necessarily like to use that word, I was imagining something like this, where very small changes kind of accumulated over time. So if we looked at an ancient species, it would look very different from the modern species of that same lineage, but very small changes throughout time. Another theory is that we're going along our merry way and then all of a sudden something happens and we change suddenly. And so if I look at a modern species, it may look very similar to its ancient ancestor, but it may also look very different uh, to its other branches of the same family. Now, which one is true? They both happen. They both happen in different situations, in different species, in different genes within a species. They're both um, going to happen for different reasons. For instance, uh, antibiotic resistance what's going to happen is we're going to go along our merry way and then we're going to come to a bottlenecking event and the bottlenecking event will drastically change our population. Um, whereas this one occurs when there's really no um, barriers to that population's growth. Um, this game, if you click on this link, is uh, a game about mimicry where you're going to pretend to be a bird and you are going to try to some of them are poisonous and you have to kind of find out which ones are poisonous and which ones are not poisonous. Now this actually occurs, there is a butterfly called the monarch and there is a butterfly called the painted lady. Visually they look exactly the same and it's very hard to tell them apart. That is because the painted lady is mimicking the other butterfly, the monarch. Birds don't like to eat monarchs. Birds like to eat other butterflies like the painted lady, but they can't find the painted ladies because they look so similar. So it's really hard for a bird to tell these apart. Like these two look really similar to me and I don't want to accidentally eat a poisonous butterfly. So as a predator, you're going to end up kind of in an arms race with your prey. The butterflies are going to change their patterns and um, or go through selections to change their patterns. And then you as the predator will have to adapt and change your eating habits based on that. So this is an example of mimicry. All right. Um, there are t several different patterns of evolution. Convergent evolution means that two different species kind of ended up at the same answer because of the same problem. For instance, a dolphin lives in the open ocean and is an apex predator. A shark lives in the open ocean and is an apex predator. A dolphin is a mammal and a shark is, um, well, it's a shark. It's a shark. Uh, I'm sorry, a cartilaginous fish. That was what I was thinking of, a cartilaginous fish. They're not related in any way, but they're both gray. They both are streamlined and they both have kind of a lighter color underbelly. They both um, 
employ some of the same behaviors in order to hunt their prey. So they have ended up with convergent evolution where they ended up with some of the same traits, even though they're not related because they live in the same environment. There's also divergent where maybe one species becomes a different species because they kind of went to different areas. So for instance, the giraffe and the okapi. An okapi lives in a heavily wooded forest area, like a densely wooded forest area, which would probably be really hard for a giraffe to move around on. Whereas the giraffe lives in this open plains area where they need to be able to go long distances to find food. So they are under different selection pressures. So the giraffe or the ancestor of the giraffe that moves into the forest is going to become shorter and it's going to become darker in color, just like the okapi. The giraffe ancestor that moves into the open plains is going to need very long legs to travel those long distances and a long neck to reach these high branches. So similar to the giraffe. Co-evolution is when um, species kind of pattern after each other or you end up with an arms race. For instance, the butterflies and the birds. But our example is going to be hummingbird beaks. And I'm going to show you that in a second because it's really interesting. But co-evolution, you can think of it as an arms race where one animal adapts to one challenge and the other one adapts to that change separately. Uh, parallel means that species will follow similar patterns of changes um, kind of without interacting to each other. Like the pattern of a leaf is going to come up kind of with the same, um, same thing as another type of leaf in the same area. Well, let me just go through the example. So convergent. Our example was sharks and dolphins, but another really great example would be marsupial mammals versus placental mammals. So we have a mouse, a little brown field mouse that is a placental mammal. We would find that in North America. And then if we look in Australia where marsupials live, this looks exactly like this mouse, except that it's a marsupial. They're not related to each other, but they follow the same niche. They eat the same food. They are the same prey animal for predators. So they do have convergent evolution because they share similar patterns. All right, here's our okapi and our giraffe example. And here we have our hummingbird beaks. Here we can see a very long straight beak is drinking nectar from a very long straight flower. But what happened here? Maybe the flower curved a little bit, so the beak curved a little bit. And then the flower curved a little bit more and then the beak curved a little bit more. Um, we won't know which one came first, but know that these changes probably happened very slowly, where the first flower curved just a little bit due to a random mutation, and all of the birds had the same kind of beak, except maybe one of them had a mutation that caused their beak to curve a little bit, and then that one was able to have more offspring, and eventually their descendants had this extreme curve to their beak. So that's an example of co-evolution. This would be parallel evolution. For instance, these lake cichlids, um, the lakes are completely isolated from each other, but they're both populated with cichlids. Um, just so happens that in Lake Malawi, Malawi, I'm so sorry, we end up with some yellow fish. And then we look at this other lake and we end up with yellow fish. And we look back at Lake Mal Malawi, I'm so sorry guys, and we have orange fish. Well, we look in the other lake and we also have orange fish. And here we have some blue fish. We look in the other lake and we also end up with blue fish, just because those niches are available. As always, you can turn in your chapter homework uh, for extra credit after the exam unlocks that opportunity. If you need the answer key to that homework, your SI leader should have the answer key to your homework. Um, the chapter laboratory write-up needs to be printed and brought to lecture class if you have face-to-face -face lab. If not, scan that QR code and watch the video. Those videos should be posted weekly on Tuesdays. Then you have your chapter quiz in Blackboard. Don't forget to take that quiz by 5 p.m. on Friday. So every week you will have a quiz due on five, at 5 p.m. on Friday. 
in Blackboard. Make sure that you take those. If you need some extra study help, the textbook is linked here, further reading, and you have vocabulary flashcards for Quizlet. In the future, I'm hoping to update these links to a coloring page and a vocabulary-based games, but those are under construction at the moment. Also, you have your practice quiz in the Genially in Blackboard. So don't forget to do your practice quiz if you want a really good idea of what might be on the Blackboard quiz, you can use the chapter quizzes located in your lesson. Thank you so much for joining me this week and I will talk to you next